Hi, my name is Nate, owner of Growers House, one of the top suppliers of cultivation equipment in the world. I help growers source equipment and put together some of the largest, most advanced cannabis growing operations. I am constantly looking for the top products and methods needed to grow the best cannabis. Join me on a tour where I get inside access to the industry's leading cannabis grow ops. This, my friends, is Cannacrips. We're here in Harrison Charter Township, right outside of Detroit, Michigan, visiting Pleasantries, known for their incredible flower quality and pressing some of the finest rosin in the state of Michigan. Now, before we get started, we're gonna meet up with White Boy Rick, an underground Detroit legend who had a movie and a documentary made about his life. Let's go and see how they do it. Well, Rick, let me let me ask you some questions. I mean, I want to even set the stage for people that are watching who who might not know you. Rick Wershey Jr. Right now, like there's a major motion, you know, picture film that came out and now there's a, a documentary coming out about you. How accurate was that movie to what actually happened in your life? The documentary is probably 75 percent true. The movie's probably 25 percent. It gave me a platform. How many people in the world can say a movie was made about their life, you know? And for those people who don't know, give us the, the shortened version, the abridged version of your, your history. I started selling drugs after I quit working for the government. I started selling drugs on my own for a short period of time. I went down to Miami, I got a good drug connect, and I kind of blew up in the underworld, and I ended up getting in trouble. They pinned, I think it was eight keys of coke or something. They said I put them under a porch even though my fingerprints weren't on it. I never touched the box, anything, but they got some people to say, oh, he put this box there. They never caught me with any drugs. I was a juvenile. No matter who got me into it or what I did, I spent almost 33 years in prison for nonviolent crimes. No, we're talking about nonviolent drug offenses. A nonviolent drug offense that the government got me involved in. So at 17 years old, you then got incarcerated for 33 years. Yeah, I'm 51 now, I haven't even been home a year. And I mean, we have Jerome here, and you know, Jerome is part of Pleasantries. You went to law school, and what is your role at Pleasantries, Jerome? So I'm the director of legal operations and social equity. The war on drugs is really a war on people, right? War on impoverished communities, black and brown communities, you name it, right? And there's a reason why, right? On purpose, nonviolent offender went away for 30 plus years. I met people in prison that were doing life for cannabis. Right, nonviolent drug-related crimes are over-prosecuted, over-criminalized, especially against poor communities, poor people. You know, Rick is a beacon, man. Like him being out and the fact that he's willing to shake somebody's hand in public and people look up to him in that way, right? Because he's a beacon of hope, it really is. So it's an honor, man, to be, have him here and be able to walk around, give him a tour of our site and whatnot. But in the social equity space, it starts with, well, number one, we're vertically integrated. We got jobs to offer. We're trying to do a better job in making sure we have a better representation of people that come from those disproportionately impacted communities and groups. Um, number two, education. Legislation and advocacy is our third pillar. One thing Pleasantries is gonna get really involved in this year, especially come out of COVID, um, are gonna be expungement fairs, know your rights clinics, things of that nature, both in Michigan as well as we span other markets like Massachusetts and do Cory seminars with their same version of that. And lastly is good neighbor. That's our fourth pillar. And basically that means supporting communities that support us. So we're fortunate to go into new places. Let's make sure we pay it forward. If we make little changes, it'll help society as a whole. This has been like a crazy powerful conversation that I honestly did not expect to have something like this today. And it's been it's been something that I'm, I'm definitely gonna walk away from thinking about. And I think our viewers are too. Hey, it's my pleasure, bro. I wish yeah. you guys nothing but success, bro.
Randy, Tim, thank you for inviting us to the Pleasantries facility. Randy, you're the CEO and founder of Pleasantries? Guilty. Guilty, oh, awesome. Well, Tim, what is your role here at the Pleasantries facility? Uh, senior Director of Cultivation. I pretty much run this facility. How long have you been growing? Uh, 30 years. Yeah, started off dabbling when I was a teenager at a local nursery. Started growing greenhouses. I had seven of them back there. Maintained, managed them for them. That's how I met this guy. He used to be a customer of mine at uh, the hydro store. And, you know, he's one of the guys that started picking up on the game quickly. And it was like we hit it off because there wasn't too many people out there with knowledge. So throw us both together and it became like a little dangerous thing. I watched his expansion go and just kept right along with him. Well, you're telling me I was crazy the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I did kind of beat him up a little bit. I was like, bro, chill out, slow down. Tim, you, you've been growing for more than 30 years. What is your process for mothers to ensure that, you know, you have the best genetics, best health, going all the way through prop and into veg? As far as feeding them goes, Ventana Plant Science, uh, I use that both in the early stage veg and for my moms. I just tweak, you know, PPM levels different depending on what stage they're at. Moms, when they come in, hitting around 1300-ish, uh, towards the end of that second month they're here before we move them, I'll get them to around 1500. But that has everything in it that I need to keep them healthy and keep them vibrant. So I'm perfectly content with running that. And how many clones do you take per mother and how often? Depending on the size of the plant, on average, you know, probably around like 30 to 50, I could take off of mom. Got it. They'll okay. recoup after a couple of weeks and I can go back at them again keep everything alive in our cloners. Um, one of the one of the products we like to use is the clear line from Current Culture. Yeah, I mean, all, it keeps all our drip emitters clean, keeps all the reservoirs clean. Um, great product um, through and through and just being able to handle it. The employees, uh, you know, safety is very important to me as a, a business owner and wanting them, you know, we do have some products like an H2O2 or something that's very harsh and have to get on your skin, you know, they have to rinse it off immediately or you know, issues with that or it can be very bad. So we're trying to work with products that employees can handle safely um, and not, you know, if they do touch it or it gets exposed to their skin, um, it's perfectly safe. And yeah. the clear lines, you know, one of the best. It works really good with our fertilizer too. I was having, we ran 03 originally and I was getting a lot of precipitate, switched off of the 03 and went into the clear line and now I have no precipitate. Everything seems to be flowing and functioning Great. The clear line improves our uh, water significantly with the increased oxidation reduction potential. Um, phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's obviously a lot of mothers behind you. You could probably have a lot of strains represented at this facility. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of a mix between, you know, what the consumer wants and what we, what we like. Uh, so you have to kind of go back and forth between, obviously for, from a business perspective, I like yields. Uh, but also, you, in order to hit the sales, you know, you want stuff that's hype, um, the new exotic stuff. So we're looking always for, you know, bag appeal, uh, potency. I mean, the market's still so potency driven. I, I personally don't care about potency when I buy cannabis. I'm looking, uh, you know, for terpenes and just different effects and whatnot. Some of my favorite strains are 20, 21, 18%. And then some of the newer breeders, you know, I'm a huge fan of. I have a tremendous amount of Canarado genetics, uh, JBZ from Seed Junkie, um, Swamp Boys, Compound. Some Sin of my City. favorites. Yep, Sin City, I got a bunch of those. And if you want to see a full list of all the genetics they have at Pleasant Trees, go to canicribs.org. So Evan, I think we walked into the bedroom at the perfect time because we just got here and I heard the irrigation turn on. Yeah, you can you can definitely see it. You can hear it. Plants mm -hmm. are having a good time with the new feeding that we got going on right now. Nice, nice. You know, Evan, why don't you tell me like, what is your role here at Pleasant Trees? So I am the director of cultivation. I'm the number two actually. So yeah. him and I correlate together on pretty much how everything's going along in this grow from even veg to the end of flower. Um, we like to make tweaks as we see things. You know, if I see something, suggesting to him, he does his little tweaking and we see if we like the results. If we don't, we just go back to our own process and then see what else we can uh, do further along. I mean, the, 
facility right now is obviously pretty expansive and you guys are even expanding to Massachusetts, yes. is it? Yes, yes. Awesome, so yeah. are you pretty involved in that project? As well? um, not with the build out, but once the, the facility is online, I'm sure I'll be ba bouncing back and forth and getting that all organized and up and running tightly. Ah, homie, you're gonna be jet set. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Let's talk about your whole veg environment, school me. So we'll start from the beginning. Uh, we wanna maintain our temperatures. You know, we're gonna be around 80 degrees, 70% humidity maintain around that 9, uh, 0 0.9 VPD, along with our CO2 around 1,000 ppms. Uh, we keep our feeding regimen pretty heavy. They're getting fed around maybe 10 times a day. Uh, once it hits that flower, we just start ramping up even more too. Got it, okay. So what about the ppms of nutrients that you feed in veg? So right now in veg, we're, we're shooting around for a 1,200 ppm target. Pretty much keep it right there actually. It's all the way through the first 14 days. And then once it hits the flower, we ramp it up even more. Got it. So you only do a 14 day veg. Yep. A lot of plants, so we want to keep it on a short cycle. Got it. Yeah. It's like a, you know, assembly line. Exactly. And you've got to make sure that everyone's busy at every point in time, you got right? It. Why don't we touch base on IPM? So our IPM regin uh, goes around Nutrifog. Right now with the Nutrifogger, it can cover 800,000 square feet in under three minutes. You do one spray, one application, and it's good for its time being in the bedroom. Damn. Okay. So it has been, by far has been the best labor cost of anything that we've put in here so far. So we also use uh, the Nutrifog for sterilization also after uh, we clean out a bedroom or flower rooms. Get all the pots out, sweep everything up, one click on the uh, Nutrifog, it fog it out in, like I said, under three minutes. It's pretty wild when you see it. So with the Nutrifogger, it's, it's relatively easy. I mean, you set it and you forget it. And when that stuff releases, it engulfs the plant to the point where you can't even see the plants when it's done releasing. You know, we have to get out of the room after it's released because it is completely smoked out like a Snoop Dogg festival. Damn, Snoop Dogg fest up in here of yeah. IPM, huh? Yeah, you got it. Well, Evan, you know, these plants, uh, they're looking beautiful and I don't want to stay too long with the AC off, so let's head out. Sounds good to me, man. Tim, so we're in one of 10 flower rooms here at Pleasant Trees. And as I understand, this room is like coming down today. Like yep. right when we're done filming this, these plants are getting chopped down. Yep, people are waiting in the hallway, <laughs> ready to go. Right on. Well, let's talk about the flowering process and how you guys, you know, really bring these beautiful girls up until this point. Uh, we bring them in from veg. Uh, lay them all out, set our first net, uh, trellis net, obviously dial in our temperature for the initial run. Temperatures will change throughout the process. Uh, space them all out, line up new irrigation every run, put our emitters in, and then we start the process. Nice. Well, let's run through those some of those parameters. In particular, I'm curious about, you know, let's talk about temps and humidity to start. Uh, 76, 61. That's 76 degrees, 61% humidity. I generally run that for the first three weeks of flower. Pretty much based on and revolves around our VPD. We put we put a certain set point with our VPD and then we let our parameters follow that. Our HVAC is ridiculous. It's just, the company is just absolutely stellar. It's AirTech. And we can hold parameters so tight that it's almost obscene. Like I can hold literally 1% in humidity between day and night and I can hold about a half a degree with temperature between day and night. And that's with day-night swings. It's like, uh, it's it's the best HVAC and controller unit that I've ever used. For a guy like me, you know, I'm an old school cat. I'm not all techy and computery, but I was able to hop right on that system, dial everything in, get, uh, I, I can see when there's troubles and understand what's happening. Like their interface is just absolutely great and user friendly. So that was a big deal for me. Papa approved? 100% pops approved. 100% pops approved. Pops approved. Would never put another building up that I'm gonna grow in without that system. Tim, we have to jump into this because you were one of the R&D facilities for Ventana Plant Science, VPS, Nutrients, and I know that you've been interfacing with George a lot. Can you tell us about that process? Um, actually, yeah, I worked with George on VPS from the beginning. Uh, it was a little like brainstorming we had about doing something specific for cannabis instead of all the kind of generic run-of-the-mill fertilizers out there. 
he's the mad scientist and you know we just kind of pinged back and forth off each other for about two years and after two years we've came up with something that actually works very well it's specifically targeted for cannabis which is nice you know because we've always used these old off-the-shelf brands and things that are kind of generic old school fertilizers i can run different ranges of ppms and i can you know like in flower for example i'll start off at like a 1400 ppms when i get into max aggressive growth phase and they're really stacking i can bump it up to about 16 1650 and everything works out beautiful i push them quite a bit even though it's at a lower ppm it works because the the nutrients are just so available so ready and the plants just gobble them up it's a I'm very impressed with this line. I'm very, you know, I'm kind of a brainiac when it comes to fertilizers. And this one's uh, actually something I'm very proud to have been part of. We've done testing. I have uh, some documentation and stuff on our test levels. As we started to tweak that, you know, I get, I'm hitting with a few strains, like nice 30 percenters. Overall cannabinoids are hitting like 34s, 35s. Um, and we've watched those strains over the past year slowly increase as we tweak the products. So now we got it to the point to where we're consistently getting numbers like that in those strains that we were testing. And we, I was like, okay, we got to stop. We're, it's good. It's not overloaded with 8 million different bottles and brands. You know, it's a standard salt base, which works really good in a commercial facility. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. It's a, nice. it's a great line, you know? Yeah. Okay, Pop, so I know your your staff is out there waiting to take these girls down, so yep. uh, let's let them in. Sounds good. They're chomping at the bit. So, Kyle, you're the founder of AirTech, and I've never been in a facility where people were so excited about getting their HVAC fixed and renovated. <laughs> Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. So obviously your reputation precedes you. You guys have been doing HVAC long before cannabis became mainstream. Yep. So our company was founded as a manufacturer's uh, supplier, manufacturer's rep. So we have manufacturers that we, we work with and we call in consulting engineers, uh, building owners, and help them apply equipment. That's what we've done our whole career. Um, and we, I have specialized in very unique HVAC applications tight temperature and humidity control being one of the biggest ones. Okay, Kyle, let's have a thought experiment. Say I'm a, a new grower building out a facility and mm -hmm. I come to you. Yep. What, what does that interaction look like? So we start, we ask a lot of questions. Um, we try to help our customers know when they're not far enough along to really size the equipment. And sometimes that can be challenging because people are in a real rush. They want to get going, want to start making product. Um, so we, we try our best to slow it down, get the right facts, get you the right system for your, your building. We design every system uniquely, you know, to meet their needs and what their plan is. So uh, when we meet with these people, um, it could be, you know, really large grow, large industrial grow. It could be a small grow. They're just getting started. We can handle all of those, but they are all handled by different system types and different system sizes. Um, we've been very fortunate to deal with all those sizes, people that are just getting started and then they're building out. Um, that's a lot of fun because to see them grow and uh, but it's really important that they know that we can we can handle all their needs and we can work with them depending on what their needs are but we need to know what they are and we just work through the process with them yeah and as far as the HVAC system goes we're able to provide all the equipment so DX systems so package systems uh, split systems we could do chillers we can do boilers we can provide the pumping systems and the controls. So really we're a one-stop shop for your HVAC. The benefit to the customer on that is when there's an issue, they know where to go. They don't have to go, oh geez, which, which contractor do I call to figure this out? Nope, they call us, we get a guy on site, we, we address the issue. We want you to think of us as part of your team. Um, as you are working on your grow and you're changing things, maybe you designed it and you changed your design midway, well, we'll help you through it. You know, there's, there's a solution to everything. We'll work through that with you. Got it. So a quick tip for those commercial growers out there. When you're going to size your HVAC, make sure you go in with every variable yes. outlined. Yes. Got it. Well, Kyle, uh, thank you for all that information. Honestly, I learned a lot just from spending half an hour with well, you. Well, good. So I appreciate yep. it. Yep, we appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Sir George, you're the formulation chemist of Ventana Plant Sciences, and you've formulated some products that have never seen the cannabis industry before. Yeah. Let's talk about those. I want to get the nutrient masterclass. All the nutrients to get them into the plant have to be in solution. And some of these compounds, where you take two elements and put them together, are more soluble than others. Calcium nitrate is exceptionally soluble. Magnesium sulfate is very soluble. But calcium sulfate or calcium phosphate are very insoluble, right? So they precipitate out of solution. They're not going to be taken out of plants. So that's why we created Flava. So Flava is based on a polyamino acid that has an anionic negative charge. And so it will persist in the soil and it will grab on to this positively charged magnesium and calcium and prevent it from interacting with other, with other nutrients like sulfur or like phosphorus as an example. And so it's a really convenient way you know, to have something that's gonna persist in the soil, you know, up to two or three months, depending on the microbial load, and it's gonna keep these nutrients in the solution. We've talked about before, up to 40% of your photosynthetic product the plant produces is released at the roots, at the rhizosphere, in, in an effort to modify either the pH, but also, and primarily for nutrient acquisition. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to save the plant energy and time you know, of finding these nutrients and then solubilizing these precipitated nutrients that might be in the soil and maximizing nutri nutrient uptake. And if we're able to maximize nutrient uptake into the plant, especially at these specific physiological times, you know, we're gonna increase our flowering sites. We're gonna shift into more reproductive growth and less vegetative growth. And we've seen that in the trials that we've done. You know, the flowers have come up, your shake weights come down, right? But also from a secondary metabolic process, I mean, that's where the name Flava was, was born, which is, you know, the VUH is volatile, unsaturated hydrocarbons, which is what a terpene is. So in our trials, you know, we're showing not only an increase in your THC or, or CBD content, you know, your general cannabinoids, but also for your terpenes. So this one's going to get Flava, and this one is not going to get Flava. We'll turn our eyes towards this other one. Now, this one does not have Flava in it. This would be more of a standard mineral program that says, hey, you know, I'm here to save some money. I know what I'm doing. I'm growing crops forever. We're just gonna use a mineral fertilizer, okay. no big deal. So we'll do, again, magnesium sulfate next. And finally, what we'll do is we'll mix in this calcium nitrate. We just wanna walk over here and look over top. Look, look over here and look here. Yeah. You can see down at the bottom there, you can't see down at the bottom here. Yeah, it's exactly. I mean, this is more like what I would call a cranberry juice. And then uh um, This is like V8. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably yeah, I mean this one obviously has some clarity to it. This one's a little bit more cloudy. So why what exactly is happening between What's the ha clarity and the cloudiness? What's happening is this polymer, this helical polymer that's anionic negatively charged, is adsorbing that calcium and that magnesium and present and preventing it from precipitating with that phosphorus and with that sulfur. I mean it boom, right there. And you saw how short that took? As soon as it entered solution practically. And so when you think about, hey, no big deal, brother. These things are separate, they're in concentrate, they're gonna go through my irrigation line, and that only takes 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Well, boom, it's already formed. George, thank you for the masterclass on nutrients. Uh, I am definitely smarter walking out of this room than I, I am coming into it. Hopefully it won't be our last time together doing this. I'd like to say any, any day in the lab's a good day. Adam, so we're in the drying room, and what is your role here at Pleasant Trees? I'm the director of post-harvest. So essentially, I'm in charge of you know the curing process, everything that's basically after harvest in the heads, like your curing, trimming, storage, all of it. Well, let's talk about the Pleasant Trees by Adam drying process <laughs> for perfection. Well, essentially, after harvest, we break all the plants down after they're weighed. So they are cut down as a single plant. They are weighed. After they're weighed, we have them broken down on tables and then they're brought into this room and we're hung essentially by about maybe five to six people. Um, and then from there, uh, this is gonna cure for a good 10 to 14 days, depending on moisture levels, how fast they dry, the size. Um, and we want it to be around a 13, 14% 
generally when we pull it out of here. So that by the time it gets to the trim room, it gets through every process and it gets to the customer that we're around maybe a 10% on there. So it's not too dry, but it does still has a little bit of moisture in there. It breaks up nice, but doesn't turn to dust. And that's uh, also when we, how we educate people in actually keeping the product, like how you should store it at your house, how you should do those things, which we have on all our products now. You can scan and it'll give you a full breakdown of what you need to do. You know, you guys are cutting the plants down, cutting them off the meristem, and then drying, and all the plants look super uniform. The reason for that in this room is for perfect airflow, because you want enough airflow going between every single plant and everything that's in here, every stem, that nothing's getting more air than another. The flow in the room has to stay the same, so that's why we have everything uniformed out. We put the exact same amount of stems on every single one of our hangers. There's the exact same amount of hangers down every single row. Uh, everything is split up into individual strains as we go through, as you can kind of see, so we can keep everything cataloged. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really is just for better curing process, better drying, so you get an overall dry that's the exact same from top to bottom. Adam, I've, I've learned a lot from you today. Honestly, your, your drive for excellence around the bud, uh, I really appreciate that and I respect it. Randy, we're at your processing facility, which you said, I, how much did you invest in this facility to build it up? So far about five and a half million. Wow, yeah. okay, so this is a significant investment for you guys because it's a significant portion of the business of pleasantries, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, right now we're just running rosin from our cultivator, bringing it over here to fresh frozen, freezing it there at the cultivator, transporting it here into a negative 40 freezer, and then washing it as quickly as we can. With the rosin, it's frozen uh, cannabis, right from the cultivator, flash frozen as quickly as possible to uh, preserve all the terps. And then transport over here, frozen as well, in a frozen transport. And then we put it into the agitator, the icon, that we have um, inside the, the freezer. So that's in a cold room as well. Nice. All the entire process is done inside of a cold room. And then it goes into our uh, freeze dryers, which you, you'll see out there. And after that, we bring it in here, press it with the flux presses, and we'll crash it a little bit inside the uh, the vac ovens and then it goes into we decided to put it into one grams or half gram cards so on the live hash rosin it's like it never gets that that heat that pressure that say distillate does it's like it never really oh we have pressure when we press it well, in some heat but nothing you know we're trying to always manage the, the temperature and that's really the secret sauce to making a rosin where you yeah. Set the temperature right to get the viscosity, especially when you're going to the cartridge, but you want to keep it low enough where you're not burning any turps off. Yeah. And that's the that's the sweet spot. Yeah, so live hash rosin, it's just like its most unadulterated form of cannabis. Pure as possible. I mean, it's transparent right back to the flower. Better the flower, the better the rosin. So what is a, is it a one gram cart? Half gram. Half gram cart, what do they sell for approximately? Uh, between 50 and $60 retail. It depends, you know, who the retailer is and obviously the more volume they order the better price point they get and they can pass on to the end consumer. Uh, and most importantly, we actually reinvest into um, the benefits and the, and the people, the, the human capital here. It's, uh, I can buy as many facilities and build as many facilities as I want, but can I staff them with the right people that actually make everything work? And that's that's the difficult part, is finding the right people that become family. And I think we've you know, done a very good job of bringing people into making a family uh, to the amount of benefits that we give. Uh, we're, over about a half a million dollars in benefits just in insurance for employees and their uh, families. When I started the company, I broke off 10% of the stock shares. So as the amount of shares we have in our company go up, it still stays at 10% that go to employees. And that 10% is not comprised of any of my stock. Randy, it was awesome seeing this processing room and learning a lot about your live hash rosin. Uh, I think it's off to the next phase. Let's go to packaging. So Randy, we're in the packaging room and I'm excited to be in this room just because in researching pleasantries before coming out here to film, 
I was kind of mesmerized by the way you guys have handled your brand, the digital design, your website, all of it is like super, I mean, it's beautiful, to it's be clean. honest. It's clean. Yep. It's like, it's inviting, but it's it's modern and contemporary. Branding is very important to us. We don't miss an opportunity to put our brand on something. Uh, we like clean lines, clean colors. The inside of our boxes, you can see we have the actual print and our jars more as well. Mm -hmm. We're actually uh, transitioning to a clear jar with the blue top, which will be on brand again. Mm -hmm. And then here we have our pre-rolls on brand, a uh, little five pack tin, these are yeah. very popular. And then you see right down to the details of the uh Even the, the sticker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Every safety sticker is your brand. Every single thing is clean lines, uh, the blue and the white. Mm -hmm. You get a good contrast there. Yeah. Any opportunity. So when somebody walks into a store, they see pleasant trees, they know they're gonna get that consistent quality and product every single time. And, and you then, guys have a few more brands coming out, right? Yeah, we're developing uh, Pops Approved, which is uh, Tim, our head grower. Hey, he started making some, uh, it was a little brand. He had his own sweatshirts, t-shirts, hats. I said, Tim, let's take this and actually make a brand around it. So we have the dye lines for that. We roll in and out three specific strains under that, um, so strain specific packaging. And then we're also uh, rolling out a, a women uh, oriented brand. And we were sitting around the, uh, the boardroom and was like, well, why would we try to come up and develop a female centric brand when there's a lot of women in pleasantries that could do that and be very arrogant of us to think that we could do that better than them. So we put together a, a think tank and uh, it's taking a little bit longer than I'd like to get to market, but I I'm very excited about it. That's me, Pistol Janes. And I can't wait to see the dye lines and then where we're taking that brand. We'll be rolling that out here, hopefully by the end of the year. Well, you know, like how much, how much uh, cannabis is really coming through this room to get packaged? Well, we're doing about 250 pounds through our cultivator per week. So every Monday we harvest and there's a you know, perpetual cycle here. You know, for 250 pounds a week to get packaged in this room, I mean, how many people do you need to do that? Uh, we've got about 20 people uh, right now currently working in the packaging department and we're looking to onboard more. So Randy, when the cannabis comes in here, how, tell me about that process. Well, we have to use a transporter from the state that I should transport it from our cultivator a quarter mile down the street to our processor to follow regulations. Uh, when it comes in, we'll have totes with um, the grow bag liners, which are just an absolute no brainer. It keeps all the tr uh, trichomes on the buds and also the bags, the grow bag. Uh, bags are the anti-static technology and the turf blocks. So we're not actually getting all the turps, you know, on a regular Ziploc bag, you'll see all the, tur the trichomes to the side of that bag. We don't get that with the grow bag and keeps all of those trichomes so they actually make it into a jar and to the end consumer. Phenomenal products. And the customer service, uh, working with them, if we need, you know, this many of this, uh, this many liners, we go through a lot of volume. I mean, we're ordering, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of units at a time for anything in packaging. And they're, you know, extremely responsive, just phenomenal to work with. It's a US company and I try to, you know, do as much as I can to support other domestic companies. We also use the Quest uh, dehumidifiers in all our rooms. We have climate controlled rooms. Anywhere there's products stored, we control the humidity and temperature. Very important to us. Oh, Everybody yeah. does that. Uh, we want to, you know, I'm not going to tell you where our set points are at, but that's very, very important. And so we, once we have that here in uh, bulk in the grow bags and the grow bag liners or the tote liners, then we will take it over to the Green Bros bud sorter here and we'll sort it into our smalls or A, B's and C's, smalls, mids, and then our, uh, our large buds. You have some serious machinery back here. This is obviously for the packaging process. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Absolutely. Uh, when the product does come here, it's uh, you know utmost importance to get the product packaged into market as quickly as possible, so it's as fresh as possible for the end consumer. The Precision Sorter uh, by Green Bros here allows us to take the bulk product, run it through it, and it'll sort our buds from you know the smalls to the mediums to the, the large buds very quickly. So then we can get it into the package as quickly as possible and sealed. Uh, we used to have 10 to 15 people that were doing that process, and now we have two people working on the machine right now. And we're able to run it through very quickly. Uh, right now they're doing eights. We can fill, I need, we get set, do different set points. We have 3.5 grams, seven grams, eight grams. We do run an eight gram quarter and a four gram eighth for good enough. Nice. Value. Yeah, absolutely. And whatever set points we have, it runs a very tight tolerance and it'll actually reject anything that's outside of that tolerance. So we're never getting short jars or short bags to an end consumer. Got it. It's all about the consistency. Absolutely. And, and the efficiency as well, doing it very quickly so we can get that product out to market, which, you know, the, these pieces of machinery are very important to that process. Well, Randy, uh, why don't we head on to the next aspect of the facility? Wonderful. Let's go.
pops. You know how I subtly flex on our sound guy? <clears throat> I make sure I, I don't turn my, my mic off when I go to the bathroom. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> he hears everything. Yeah.